I kept looking for lenses, and people would say, well, where's all the equipment? I want to demonstrate that actually the only piece of equipment it is is a piece of glass. David Hockney, our most celebrated living artist, reveals that 400 years before the invention of the photograph, artists were using simple cameras to capture stunningly realistic images on canvas. In a Hollywood studio, Hockney recreates masterpieces by Vermeer, Caravaggio and Van Eyck and demonstrates the secret techniques they use to create such vivid pictures. His extraordinary new evidence rewrites the story of some of the most famous paintings in the world. In my studio, we pinned up hundreds of color photocopies of paintings. Paintings which seemed to have an optical look and paintings that did not. Slowly, we got a kind of order. I put Northern Europe at the top and Southern Europe at the bottom. The wall was necessary because I could then sit back and scan centuries of Western painting. We worked back further and further, and finally we got to a date where beyond that, it is very different. And that date is approximately 1420. That date is when a big change occurs. That's been observed by every art historian. The explanations for it are everybody could suddenly draw better. Uh, really? Uh, not that good an explanation, not that rational, really. So, we are focusing on this sudden change that happened. So what is an explanation? Concave mirrors were used by artists for about a century. But then a superior technology came along, the lens, which is much more versatile. The projections now can be almost any size you want. They can be life-size, they can be tiny, they can be anything. With the mirror lens, that's not true. You see, it's a certain scale. It's that scale of the Netherlands portraits. So obviously, once you got this superior piece of equipment, you don't bother with the other. This is Sick Bacchus by Caravaggio, painted in 1594. To me, this seems to have been done with the concave mirror because he's constructed in sections like the Flemish paintings. Now look at this one painted a year later. The space is quite different. Look at them together. The one on the left is much closer to you. It seems more like the Flemish painting. The one on the right is set back further, more like a photograph. These two paintings, it seems to me, show the move from mirror lens to lens.
OK, Rich, pick up the glass of wine. Pull it back to you a bit more. Hold it there. OK, rest it. Put it down. Now pick it up again and I'll tell you exactly where to put it. Now down a bit. Down a little bit. OK. That's how, if he rested, you'd get it back. And Caravaggio did make marks like that in the paint. But there was a slight technical hitch using a lens. Unlike the mirror lens, the picture is reversed. He picked it up, of course, with his uh, right hand, but here it looks as though his, his left hand, uh, because this is a straight projection, um, not using a mirror to reverse it again. Uh, everything is reversed now. Once I realised this, I started to notice a large number of left-handed drinkers, never seen in Giotto, by the way. When you reverse the paintings, the amazing thing is they look more harmonious and natural. In this painting of 1660 from the Franz Hals Museum, everyone is left-handed including the man pointing at them. Try that with your hands. The chances of finding three left-handed people and, look, a left-handed monkey seem to be remote. Eventually, artists found a simple remedy to this problem. Bounce the image from the lens onto your canvas with a flat mirror. Of course, this is another piece of equipment and very expensive. Pick the wine glass up, Rich. He now picks it up with his right hand. Because we, the mirror, flat mirror, is reflecting the image through the lens. Beautiful. Beautiful. Highlights in the eyes. Gorgeous, yeah. Once you begin to see the optical base, you notice other strange things. Parmigianino's lady has a massive right shoulder. In Van Dyke's Genovese lady, if she stood up, she'd be 12 foot tall. The peasant wife by Georges de la Tour has legs out of proportion to her body. She seems to be on stilts. This is what can have happened to Georges de la Tour. We get the projection like this, and you get very clear, let's get the face in focus. You get the face in focus, so you get the points where things would be. The hands are in focus. Then, to make this dress in focus at the feet, you see, you're moving it. You see how she's been lengthened. As you can see, when you tilt things, things squeeze up. And that is what is happening. That is why we get what we call these kind of optical distortions.
You see, it's a very simple way the lens can move. It just tilts that way or that way. You can also actually tilt this way and this way. It's now going out of focus. As I'm tilting the lens, it would focus something else. From about 1500 to about 1860, you never see a badly done basket. They always get the weave in the right place. The projection itself here is just simply ravishingly beautiful. The different tones of greys that are set up here, tiny highlights you can see. If I'm looking at it three-dimensionally, they're quite hard to see uh, exactly where they are, because if you move as well, the shine changes. Here it does not. It will not change. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Techniques of using the lens, of course, varied enormously. The work doesn't have to look like a photograph. Franz Hals, for example, never made a drawing. There's no known drawing by him. He worked straight onto the canvas with very loose brushwork, yet the underlying precision is uncanny. Almost no drawings survived from Velasquez either. He didn't seem to make many. I always wondered how did he paint that silk so perfectly, so fast? Well, I'm only pointing out here, say, this red satin. Now, of course, uh, this isn't the real Pope. This is a Hollywood Pope. And actually, this is a bit of Hollywood uh, silk. So it's not quite uh, doing the things that the real Pope would. But nevertheless, you can see that on this flat surface, the whole of these subtle reds, how few there are actually, and how that shine is in a right place. That a few brush marks by a very clever painter could capture very quickly, just as Velasquez's brush marks are fast. They are made fast, like that. I'm just making the point that on the flat surface, as you can see, the folds uh, and subtleties of highlight are all here. Absolutely, and very beautiful. Absolutely very beautiful to look at. The Pope was certainly there for painting the head, but not necessarily for the robe. A mannequin could have been used. This is a reconstruction of Caravaggio's lute player. Once you see a projection like this, you fall in love with its magic, capturing the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface. For an artist to see it is to use it. They would have been thrilled. Of course, that not all artists would have used optics directly, but once one did, others would see the result and be influenced by the look we still are. The mirror lens seemed to be used for drawing first and then painting. But how can you use a lens to tell a story? The master of setting this scene seems to be Caravaggio. Let's look at the card sharks by Caravaggio. It's a story about deceit. There are three brightly lit figures in the painting, but he's used one model twice. The space between the characters is quite shallow and they appear pressed together. 
and the standing man is surely meant to be looking over the boy's shoulder at his hand of cards. But there seems to be some confusion. He's actually looking at the back of the boy's head. Many people have suggested he was like a film director, and now, as a description, it seems not far from the truth. OK, how we, we, tell me when... I, I want to start soon, cos he's very hot. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yeah. And the face is good. We're going to start. Sorry, you can't hear. Keep looking up, Rich. Okay. And we're going to start. Right. Stay still. The first problem is a lens can only project one model at a time. In fact, the lens has a hot spot in the middle, so Caravaggio would have to find a way of dealing with this. He would work out where in the composition the projection is required. Now, wait a minute. Uh, you can move in one minute. Wait a minute. Rich, uh, you can move away in... Now, actually. Go on, you can move away. OK, now, I want to do his hand. Another essential is to decide where to focus the lens. I'm having to reposition the cameras to get his hand in focus. Don't forget, we saw this happening in the Lotto painting. Changing focus changes scale. You can see that quite clearly in Caravaggio's Supper at Emmaus of 1601. This hand here is bigger than the bowl of fruit. He's That's going, it. He's going to be here. That's it. It's going to be That's like it. this. Now we've got a rough position for the first character, we need to set up the position for the second character. I'll be using the same model, like Caravaggio, but while the model is changing, I'm using a standing to set up the position as you would in a movie studio. Also note, it is the canvas that has moved position. The model is going to sit in the same position as the first model. They all sit in the same space. Hence the problem of space. Very good, yeah. Now the hand's about there. That's it. Now, wait a minute. Uh, put your hands round the cards better. You see? Very good. And look at the cards rather innocently. Yeah, very good. Uh, I just can't see his face very good. Uh, that's it. Yes. Better. Now, just turn, looking at the car. Are you looking at the cards, Rich? Yeah?
Shall we start? Have a look at that. <coughs> and let's do the other. OK, you can move. <clears throat> and now we want... Uh, Wanted to raise his right hand here. Uh, Actually, let me just show him that. He's now to be looking back here. Looking back here. Looking over there. Next. The last figure. What I'm trying to do is position his head so his eyes are looking at the cards. But as with Caravaggio, the whole process is very difficult because the model is looking at something that is not there. And you see this in movies too. When actors are filmed in close-up, it's usually done separately, so they have no fixed position to look at. And it's very easy to get the eye line wrong. You can see this in other paintings. Doubting Thomas, for instance, looks past his finger. This is hard. This is very hard. I can't see the... Um, OK, wait a minute. Just leave it there. OK, stay still, please, Michael. Uh, I'm going to stop. Uh, well, you move, Michael. I'm going to have to have a look at it. I'm not showing her. This is very hard. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look at it, actually. <laughs> Tom? Yeah. Of course, I knew about the problems afterwards, and we're still having problems of eye, line, scale, and so on. But I should think Caravaggio was so thrilled with the image, he wouldn't have noticed. Everybody is thrilled with new technology at first. It's only later that you notice the limitations. But his eyes are in the real painting, are looking behind, actually. Uh, he did them like that, didn't he? Optics. I was going to say, do not make marks. Don't. They shortened it. My English school teacher mentality. Do not make optics. Do not make marks. Um, uh, I made the marks. The optics made a picture there, but that picture is ephemeral, remember. Until, until 1839, and chemicals could uh, freeze it, as it were, uh, these images were there, but they were ephemeral, uh, meaning they'd be gone. The only record made is some artists doing that. The artist paints the pictures, and it is his painting skills that count. The hand is in control even when it is inside the camera. And then in 1839, chemical photography was invented by Daguerre in France and Fox Talbot in England almost at the same time. Photography is usually seen as the start of something, but it is in fact the end of something. The artist's hand in the camera was replaced by chemicals. After the invention of photography, 
painters no longer had a monopoly on images you could call real, natural, true to life. So artists began to look elsewhere for other ways of depicting reality. This 1889 Van Gogh is not considered real like a photograph. It's a reaction against the photograph. Nor is this Byzantine Christ considered true to life. It's done before artists discovered optics could be used to make pictures. Before and after, very similar. Awkwardness returned to painting about 1870. An avant-garde emerged. They wanted to find fresh ways of depicting the world. Cezanne doubts the position of things. He is using two eyes. It's more human. Cubism in the early 20th century combines multiple viewpoints. But in the end, the single viewpoint the frozen moment triumphed. With the advent of film and television, the tyranny of the lens was complete. With a moving image, it's almost impossible to have more than one viewpoint. But we are now at the end of chemical photography. A new tool has arrived, the computer. The computer allows us to manipulate images. Manipulate means to use the hand. The hand is back in the camera. Chemical photography only lasted about 170 years. Look carefully at this painting by Bouguereau, painted in 1896. Art history says Cezanne triumphed over this kind of painting, the kind of which he thought was dishonest madness. But the problem is, Bouguereau is closer to what we are seeing today. In the 1890s, Bouguereau was probably projecting photographs to make this. You can see quite clearly the girl is lying on a table, oblivious to the wave about to crash over her. It's really an absurd picture. All he did was put in a back projection. He could have placed her anywhere, just as you do on the computer today. We seem to live in an arrogant age. In fact, the idea that there is not much to learn from the past is rather disturbing. In some ways, we might say we do know more, but we seem to have forgotten some things that they knew in the past. You could say we still live in a perspective nightmare. The single point of view will always restrict our perceptions. There seems to me a great, big, beautiful world out there, and we are hemmed in. Don't you want to get out to see a bigger space, a bigger picture? I think we do. Exciting times could be ahead. <laughs>